Hello, and welcome to Crafting a Revolution, the podcast. My name is Katie Freeman, and I'm one of your hosts. Every week, we bring you interviews with makers of all kinds from all over the world that identify as female, non-binary, or transgender. This episode's guest is Christina Cordova, who received a Bachelor of Arts from the University of Puerto Rico and continued to earn a Master of Fine Arts in Ceramics from the New York State College of Ceramics at Alfred University. In 2002, she entered a three-year artist residency program at Penland School of Crafts, where she later served on the Board of Trustees from 2006 to 2010. Recognitions include, included a USA Artist Fellowship and American Crafts Council Emerging Artist Grant, a North Carolina Arts Council Fellowship, a Virginia Group Foundation Recognition Grant, and several International Association of Art Critics Awards. Her work is part of the permanent collections of the Renwick Gallery of the Smithsonian American Art Museum, the Fuller Craft Museum, the Mint Museum of Craft and Design, the Museum of Contemporary Art of Puerto Rico, the Everson Museum and the Mobile Museum, among others. She currently lives and works at Penland. And let me just say, um, I'll be including the link on how you can follow along with her over on Instagram. Uh, but if you want, you can stop right now, go find her on Instagram, Christina Cordova. Uh, she makes amazing figurative sculptural work from clay, uh, very large pieces and, um, I, I enjoy learning about her process, what she loves about clay, loves about teaching, all of that. It was a great conversation uh, with Christina. Before hopping into that conversation with her, I want to give a big shout out and thanks to the patrons over on Patreon. So first, thank you so much, uh, Matthew from Artigiano Serio and Bonnie from Toolmom, Bonnie, toolmomstore.com. Both of them are full on podcast sponsors. So thank you so very much for helping to keep the podcast going. In addition to that, I want to thank the other patrons as well. So thank you, Candice, CJ Woodgrain, Lee Lee Runyon, Annette 513 Woodworks, Katie Thompson, Women of Woodworking, Kevin, Lefty's Woodshop, Christy, Twisted Twine, Jeremy, Jeremy Spies, Sammy, Go Sammy Lee, uh, Rachel Moody Makes, Laura Oakley Soap Company, Brandy Studio Obey, Lee the Rainbow Carver, Ellen Little Bear Furniture, and Ethan, Ethan Carter Designs. Thank you all so very much again for your ongoing continued monthly support helping to produce the podcast every week. Now let's head on into the conversation I had with Christina Cordova. And um, Christina, I like to ask my guests to introduce themselves. Would you do that for me? Uh, yes. Um, my name is Cristina Cordoa. I am a figurative ceramic sculptor originally from Puerto Rico, and I currently live and practice in Penland, North Carolina. Okay. Okay. Um, and I want to kind of take a step back and ask a broader question about what is the, your kind of overall story from like baby Christina, you know, where you were born to how you got to be making sculpture in North Carolina? Um, wow. Okay. That's a big <laughs> arc. <laughs> so I was actually born in Boston when my parents were finishing their studies there. And so I was a couple of months old when they moved back to Puerto Rico, to San Juan, and um, had a pretty nice childhood. I think I was a restless child and my parents were very busy. And my mom realized somewhere along the way that art and creativity really honed my attention for long periods of time. <laughs> so she slowly started to um, include different art experiences into my routine from a very early age and so I think um, from the beginning as my sense of self that could kind of take shape maker was kind of a part of it um, at first mostly through drawing and painting and then later on um, sculpture and ceramics came into 
um, the equation. And um, yeah, I did a high school um, at a Catholic a school in San Juan with nuns and um, <laughs> uniforms. And then went to the University of Puerto Rico on the West Coast in Maya West to do my undergraduate. And at the tail end of that was when I had my first ceramics class with an amazing teacher. And um, he kind of revealed the possibilities of this material as something that could really like hold the imprint of your personal frequency. And he was an architect, so he was using it in really large scale projects. And it just really felt like this material that could be anything. And it was really captivating. And so I, I never stopped um, using it since then. And so after that, I wanted to continue learning about it. And I ran out of possibilities in Puerto Rico. Uh, and so I left to pursue a, a special student status at Alfred University, the New York State College of Ceramics. And then I stayed there to do my master's. And then from there, I came, came to Finland for a three-year residency and have been here ever since. <laughs> awesome. The rest has just been um, making and working and teaching and kind of like evolving that um, that practice. Mm -hmm. Awesome. I have not been to Penland. Um, it's definitely like on my bucket list of places I need to like go see and visit and potentially take a class at at some point in time. Yeah, absolutely. I've seen yeah. you've had many a Penland folk yes come your <laughs> podcast so <laughs> you must be very well acquainted with it yes <laughs> um I'll be in the North Carolina area in August but I don't know if I'll be any my family and I are taking a trip to the Smoky Mountains as a uh, vacation before I start grad school so wow you know, We'll be, we'll be maybe in the area. I don't know how close those two things are to each other. I don't know North uh, Carolina geography at all. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's um, pretty wide. So sometimes yeah. people are surprised at how far <laughs> things can be from each other. But yeah, if you are even an hour away, I would recommend it. It's really nice. And for kiddos, it's great yeah. too. So. Yeah, yeah. Um. So... You said something I thought was interesting, which I think you thought was interesting from what your teacher said when you said it holds the frequency of things. Um, can you tell me more about that? Uh, yeah, I think because of the nature of clay, um, the fact that it's just made from a lot of organic material suspended in this um, plastic state, it is so receptive to your frequency as it's channeled through your, your touch. Um, and um, that really captivated me because that could be something really um, gestural and instinctive, like squishing something and then opening your hand and seeing what's left. And understanding, you know, how much pressure went into it and um, and just extracting concepts through that. Or it can be something really elaborate and something, you know, much more technical and controlled that could give place to, you know, a China set. Mm -hmm. uh, as we know, these historical, you know, exquisite um, objects. And so... Clay does everything. It's essentially the same material um, handled and manipulated in different ways. And I was just really um, in love with that range, you know? Do you connect with it too, like, um, tactically? Like, just the feel of working with clay is something that... Um, brings you joy yeah yeah absolutely and I think in my own practice like I 
um, move through that range quite a bit. There are some things that are more um, visceral and more dynamic and how that surface and how that um, plasticity is um, being explored. And then there's other parts that are more refined and more carefully considered and uh, less evidence. It, there's less evidence of my sense of touch mm-hmm. of the maker. Um, yeah. The way you describe it, it seems like um, almost like a spiritual experience. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think that word spirituality is so interesting. I mean, I grew up Catholic, and so my first take on spirituality was definitely grounded in that whole system. Mm-hmm. And since then, um, it has blown up to include so much more. Um, And I'm really fascinated with that intersection between the body and the spirit. Mm -hmm. And I feel clay is just like such a perfect material to explore, you know, those notions of um, that multifaceted quality of of what what I consider spirit um, or embodied spirit. So, yeah, I would definitely say it has a very strong spiritual dimension for me. Mm-hmm. Yeah, everything you're saying about clay resonates for me, except for in wood. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, because, like, I mean, predominantly the thing that get, draws me to wood the most is is when I'm sculpting it. And it definitely feels very, I don't know, just the interaction between the material and the person um, it can feel meditative, it can feel spiritual, it can feel all of those things, um, which I would say is probably why people like us are artists or makers, um, because it is about making something, it's about the interaction with the material, it's like all of those things wrapped into one. (laughs) Mm -hmm. You said so you get to teach it now what do you what what do you like about teaching um versus making like being you know uh maybe like a solo artist Mm -hmm. well it's interesting because when I started teaching I did it primarily as a way to balance my cash flow Mm -hmm. (laughs) in between exhibitions and I actually resented it a little bit because it took me away from the studio or most of my attention was just really um, activated and I wasn't teaching um, in academic setting. So it was more like had folks that were just curious or wanted to, you know, immerse themselves more casually within the realm of ceramics. But at some point that started to change and it became really nurturing to me. Um, I don't know if it's something that happens to all artists when they hit that (laughs) midlife mark where it's like something flips and instead of craving that inward flow of energy you almost need to expel it as much as you bring it in otherwise just it just doesn't feel um like it makes sense Mm -hmm. so so yeah some years ago that happened and so the the teaching part started to grow and become more elaborate and that led to different ways of getting the information across either through the standard you know one-on-one workshop or virtual lessons that really Mm -hmm. took off um, because of COVID and ultimately um, a written um, version of 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 a course in the format of a book Um, so yeah all that has been um Taking up about taking up about half of my practice, if not more at times. Yeah. I definitely want to learn more about the turning a course into a book. What was that process like? Um, you know, <laughs> uh, so it was kind of a blur. I did it in the middle of a very busy year, but it essentially became this ongoing routine that it, um, you know, anchored the ebb and flow of of my year. And I had a a great 
team of people that offered support. I had like people close to me, um, like my assistants and my partner who became like preliminary editors. And then I had a formal editor tied to the publishing house that added another filter. And, and it was, I mean, it was amazing. I also had the photographic um, summary, which was really interesting to, you know, having gone through a live um, version to a video version and then from there to an image-based version was really um, it was daunting because yeah. all of a sudden you had you know a couple of images there's a finite amount of, of pages that would hold that information so it really forced me to simmer down um, and you know take my best stab at expressing something that I see as being so rich and and deep into just a paragraph and that's it and um <laughs> yeah so it was really it was great I mean I see it as something dynamic I mm -hmm. see it, it I had to eventually shift out of this weight of feeling like oh it's a book and it's forever going to right. um limit the this material and to something like no it's a book it's just making it more accessible but it's one edition mm -hmm. and it can keep morphing and changing and compounding in other ways and that made me a little bit lighter about it mm -hmm. so yeah yeah I can I can imagine that I mean I've not I've not created anything as lengthy <laughs> as as a book but even just like you know I wrote an article like kind of a how-to article for um popular woodworking on power carving and I know like at least my process was I had my photographer take pictures along the way as I made it and I hadn't written I didn't write anything until it was after you know it was kind of complete and then I went back through the pictures and attempted to kind of like line up what I was writing to what was captured um, <clears throat> visually to tell the story um and and it was definitely hard I think to put it into it was hard to put into words and like to get across you know even with the help of the image like get across exactly what I'm talking about and and so that took like that was very stressful. My reaction to stress is to procrastinate. So I think I left myself like a day and a half of like, you know, until deadline to cram in all of that writing. Um, but I can't, I, I imagine it to be harder to try to come up with a fuller volume um, because you want to get across not only, I think you want to get across like the love of the material and your passion for the work, but also then like technique and technique Absolutely. is hard to describe. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's funny because technique seemed to me to seem to be the easiest thing that I could articulate, I think because I've taught it for so long. Mm -hmm. But then it came out in such a dry kind of like... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> flat way and so I, I realized like what you were saying like how do I get across my passion and how do I make them feel like I'm there with them and that's when um, working with editors and putting the material through different you know brains to mm -hmm. get some feedback and understand okay how, how is this being received um, and almost like transforming that um, monotone and yeah. Yeah. you know narrative of do this do this do yes. this and to <laughs> do this and then notice this and then you know so just to have it come alive so you know just the my my insight into how to write an instructional piece suddenly evolved immensely and like with anything it's a craft you know like mm -hmm. I if I were to do it again and again and again I'm sure it could slowly you know <laughs> become a thing but anyway it was super humbling and exciting and nerve-wracking and you name it. <laughs> mm -hmm. Today's episode is sponsored by Athena Outfitters. Athena Outfitters is a quality workwear brand for hardworking women that sells everything badass beauties need to get the job done from work boots to basics. They curate the toughest essentials made to help 
you perform, every piece is handpicked to seamlessly slide right into your daily lifestyle, from rugged and roguish weekday wear to effortless weekend flair. You can fill your closet with gear that can do it all. So for Christmas, I ordered my wife like a very nice pair of slippers from Athena Outfitters, and she loves them. Loves them so much that she has accidentally gone to the gym and the grocery store in them because they seem to never leave her feet. So definitely a place to go check out, go get the goods that help you not only out in the shop, but just in your daily uh, work around the house and outdoors. As a listener of the podcast, you can go to Athena Outfitters website and use coupon code M. M as in M&Ms, 15 for 15% off any purchase. So again, you go to athenaoutfitters.com and use the code MM15 and get 15% off of your purchase at checkout. Where did the, where did the, um, I guess, direction or idea come to, to go the book route? versus just the impersonal and virtual teaching? Um, Well, you know, I think again with COVID, so many people have turned to um, at home possibilities for learning and books are definitely a big part of that. And there's several companies that focus on offering these um, tutorials in book format. Mm -hmm. Uh, And so I was approached by one and, And I had been thinking about it. My sister who works in the realm of succulents and and plants had done one and she had felt that it was like a powerful tool for herself Mm -hmm. and uh, and a way to to share with some students that like entry-level students that might need something before they can jump into a virtual course or an in-person course. So all those things made sense to me. Um, There's something also about feeling like you're published, like not a like in the ego sense necessarily, although it just, it feels yeah. good, but, but also in the sense of like knowing that at some point you took whatever you had in you and wrote it and it's there for posterity and some yeah. redone format in some obscure library somewhere. So um, yeah, I think I also had that romantic sense of being yeah. the author of this book. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's interesting. Um, kind of totally unrelated but a similar sentiment came across and and something I was watching about like European history and um you know some of the first uh kings that started to document their uh in a written format document you know their story and this thought coming across of like if it's not documented it it didn't happen. Like eventually those verbal stories, like you can be well known in your local community. And after you pass stories of you can continue to be passed on, but eventually that dies unless there's some kind yeah. of like written um, thing around. Testament. You. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And in, in my memory in particular is so fickle. I mean, I, I, I've come across people that have extraordinary memories, but my memory is like, like water, <laughs> you know, <laughs> I sometimes, you know, oftentimes I wish I had, you know, this super sharp memory. Other times I'm so gr- grateful, you know, that my memory just takes yeah. things and kind of like resets them in this like really interesting way. But yeah, like when you have something that's written that holds what you knew in relationship to that one subject in that one moment in time, there's right. something really, I don't know grounding about that yeah so. yeah exactly <clears throat> um so I, I you know looking at the pictures you sent me today they were very large pieces that you were working on <laughs> <laughs> so I wanted to get into I definitely want to ask you like what was the progression into working on you know pieces of that scale was it like from the get-go or was it kind of you know working your way up oh definitely working my way up um I think I started working big uh, about mm, 12 years ago when I had 
the opportunity to achieve it in a really huge space and the prospect of having to make so many pieces to fill that space like terrified me. So everything scaled up and um, and that was also possible because I discovered paper clay, which is just a, a clay blend that has paper pulp that together with the grog um, creates a really strong um, body that facilitates, you know, that upward construction yeah. and gives it a lot of dry strength. Um, yeah, so once I started down that path, I eventually landed on photographic references as blueprints for building specific people in my life. And my daughter, Eva, has been probably my most consistent model for the last uh, six years. So she is one of the uh, she she is the muse for one of the photos that I sent you. And yeah, I photograph her, I print at the scale, I measure her and use those measurements to reconcile any um, distortion from the lens. And mm -hmm. then I sculpt in the round from those images. That just, I don't know, that just sounds amazing that you have the skill to do that. Um, <laughs> I just coming from somebody who, I mean, I, I sculpt wood. I don't do realistic sculpture for a reason because it terrifies me. Um, because if you're trying to replicate somebody that already exists or existed and there was visual proof, <laughs> of them, <laughs> um, then it's it's noticed when you don't get it right. Uh, <laughs> I'll put it that way. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I that's always on the table. Yeah. Um, but I also feel, especially in the realm of the figure, I think it's really easy to say or to envision it as a specific talent and it's not, it's really a skill. And once you train your eye to pick up on certain measurements that you can translate onto your sculpture, it really is, you know, like any other, it is like woodworking. I mean, it, it, how you measure and, and how you, um, integrate all those different viewpoints is different and of course the material is different but it's very much a skill so you can build on it and it's accessible to anyone really maybe someday i'll believe you if i can get past if i can get past the fear in my own head um, <laughs> was it what so that large scale was that the first time you've done that i'm assuming it was not the first time you've done figurative work that exhibit? Uh, no, no, I have been working with the figure since grad school. Um, but the big one, so it's because it, with clay, it's a combination of what you can do in terms of your method. And the method could be the same for small sculptures as with huge ones. So once your method is grounded, you have that, you know, under your belt, but then you're limited from, uh, by your um, equipment, right? You're limited by how big your kiln is, how much weight you can handle. And um, my drive to move up had to do first with spill it, like engaging a space in a specific way. And then mm -hmm. second to that, as I acquired bigger equipment, I was able to kind of embolden myself to get bigger. And, and that large, big torso was the result of that last step where I got a, a really big kiln. And I'm like, okay, well, I'm going to make the biggest piece that I can fire inside this chamber. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's the measurements for that piece came from the internal measurements of that kiln. What is that process? I mean, how do you, how do you kiln something that big? So the kiln that I have, there's many different ways. The kiln that I have, it has a base that has wheels on it that you can bring into your studio and build right on that base. So you don't have to build this gotcha. epic monolithic thing and then move yeah. it. And then you wheel it out and you stack these rings up to 60 inches. And then you connect everything to this electrical box that tells the um, different rings how to move the temperature throughout the firing cycle. Mm -hmm. And um, 
And so that's what I did. I unstacked everything, moved it in, built it, taking into account, you know, the, the measurements, the boundaries that mm-hmm. those um, stacking rings would bring. And then wheeled it out, stacked it, dried it, fired it um, twice, once for bisque and the second for glazing. Mm-hmm. And then once that was all said and done, I reached out to my um, amazing neighbors um, that are part of Penland School of Crafts to come mm-hmm. down with their tractor and help me lift the figure off the base and onto a platform so that it could be shipped to its destination. Did you hold your breath until it arrived and you had confirmation that it was all in one piece? <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's it always, I've been doing this for so long and my ability to buffer that stress <laughs> seems to go down, down, down. <laughs> um, but it, yeah, it always happens. You do it and you're like, you're trying to play it cool <laughs> until the very end. And you know, Many times I, I have run into big hitches. Sometimes the pieces just don't fire well. So there's like a certain humility that this medium teaches you. Um, I've seen it also in glass. Mm-hmm. And, I mean, I'm sure it comes across in, in different ways in different mediums. But um, yeah, you kind of have to invest yourself fully, but also be willing to detach fully because, yeah. um, yeah, there's a lot of steps between point A and that ultimate mm-hmm. showing moment. Yep. Yeah, definitely. I haven't had, I haven't sent anything to a gallery before until very recently. And usually when I ship wooden pieces, I'm not all that worried about it. You know, um, overall, I figure it's that will make it there in one piece. I feel it's sturdy. Um, but this was the first time where I had, this was so, solely an artistic piece. It had no functionality to it. And I had intentionally made it fragile. Like I wanted that, that's what I wanted out of this art piece is something like with strength of wood to be as you know thin and fragile as I possibly can make it and then I'm shipping it and I mean I definitely held my breath (laughs) until I got word that it was like there and in one piece and it wasn't like crumbled in the box when they opened it up um yeah yeah (laughs) yeah we pack we we pack packing is, is pretty um intricate yeah. <laughs> and at the studio, um, unfortunately, the best way that I have found to pack is through the use of foam, um, at least in some measure. Yep. Yep. I wish it wasn't the case. Um, and I'm always researching, you know, the most environmentally sound ways to replace this foam whenever I can. But um, but right now we have, you know, a little protocol that works really well and we've been shipping all over. So yeah, just took about 10 years to figure it out. <laughs> <laughs> and this is out of your studio. So you still yeah. you maintain a studio practice outside of uh, teaching and all of that fun stuff. Yep. Okay. How do you keep the balance? Because you also mentioned your daughter. So, and I am very aware <laughs> of what, um, when you have kid add kids and family into the mix, um, what you used to spend in your studio practice is not no longer what you get to spend in your studio practice. Yeah. Um, so when I look at my year, I break it down into teaching and making, and I set the um, teaching cycles. I pull those weeks out and then um, start working on, you know, the PR and the marketing for that. And I do that strategically, again, to support the making cycles Mm -hmm. where um, income slows down and I'm mostly like investing um, Mm -hmm. by hiring help or getting materials or purchasing equipment. Um, So yeah, it's kind of like an ebb and flow. Mm -hmm. So I don't divide it half and half. That wouldn't make sense to me um, because I do want to... uh, well, keep myself fresh, but also have it have the function of balancing my mm-hmm. flow. 
in terms of the material um, quality of the studio budget. Yeah. When you're doing studio work, do you already have, are you being invited to shows and um, galleries or are you seeking out those mm -hmm. uh, exhibits? So that has changed a lot throughout the years. Right now, I am mostly either pursuing commissions or being commissioned by my gallery to produce things for projects that they are involved in, mm -hmm. um, meaning like group shows or museum exhibitions of sorts. Um, and yeah, sometimes I, I still do, um, I get invited to an exhibition and, mm -hmm. um, and I'll make a couple of pieces for, for that. Before, like when I first started, it used to be that I would plan exhibitions and just work, you know, three months, have an exhibition and start again. I would do like three a year. Um, and it was wonderful, but eventually it was unsustainable. It just really wasn't what I wanted to do. And the work, the quality of the work, I felt started to come down because it was just being churned at such a speed that I didn't have time to replenish like conceptually or um in different important ways. So I think now I'm a lot more um, selective and um, yeah, I, get, I mean, rigorous, I don't, that word has like a negative connotation, but I am, I feel I am a lot more rigorous in terms of what I will allow myself to, to do and not do. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's like a good thing for me. Um, because it makes me slow down and pay more attention and, and be more discerning so that at the end, all, all that pays off in a different way. And, and the result is usually something that I can um, thoroughly um, feel excited and, and proud of, so. Mm -hmm. Do you feel like you're teaching or maybe more specifically the students you end up interacting with um, influence your work at all? Yeah, absolutely. It's definitely um, an exchange. Mm -hmm. And um, and I think there's different types of students. Like I have the students, like I mentioned before, that are more um, a lot of people that have recently retired or folks that were maybe artists in different medium and are really curious. And then I have, every so often, I would have these young, um, really hungry students. And I realized that the energy they brought eh, was very powerful. And I specifically felt that with artists from my country. And so I've recently started to invest more time in growing that student base by creating funds to or partnerships to sponsor more scholarships, either for them to take classes, because oftentimes, you know, my courses are expensive and, mm -hmm. you know, they need um, support or to come and do internships in my studio. A, I have um, a project um, in June where I'm having two Puerto Rican artists come and intern with me for two weeks. And then they're going to take a two week class with Penland at Penland School of Craft mm -hmm. all around the medium of clay. And so I'm really excited about um, continuing with the workshops, but also opening up these different learning possibilities for uh, minority youth. Yeah, I, I was gonna ask, I, I wanna ask about that, maybe spend a little time talking about the, your experience um, in this space of clay and the space of sculpture, um, being Puerto Rican, have you, how's, how has your experience been, I guess, in those spaces? You know, from, I guess from the beginning, my Puerto Rican identity has always been at the forefront of my making. Um, I think it's pretty evident in some way or another that I'm feeding from that perspective to create this work. I, I think once I came to the United States, my images opened up more so that they became a little bit more universal. Mm 
-hmm. because I felt I had to play both to my native audience, but also, you know, an American um, audience. And um, it's been wonderful in many ways to feel like I have a distinct voice to contribute. In other ways, as with any other immigrant story, you do go through cycles of feeling you know, isolated and displaced and just out of your culture. Mm -hmm. And luckily, because Puerto Rico, I mean, I shouldn't say luckily. Um, But, you know, the reality is that Puerto Rico is a commonwealth. And so it's a a territory of the United States. And it affords me, I have U.S. citizenship and it affords me the ability to access my homeland Mm -hmm. fairly easily. And so I, I am able to travel there. And since the beginning of my professional career, I have gone there on a yearly basis to teach or exhibit. Uh, so, so yeah, it's been like these two worlds that I've been navigating. And it's been really interesting because I will exhibit here and kind of like gather the sense of how the work was understood and then I'll exhibit similar work in Puerto Rico and and oftentimes it's drastically different how that work comes across and um and you know as an artist you're always building the sense of your audience in the back of your mind and using that to structure what you're going to offer next and and so to have these two different voices has always been a wonderful and 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 sometimes challenging Hey makers, today's episode is sponsored in part by toolmomstore.com. At toolmomstore.com, you can find any and all tool-based merchandise for all genders, all sizes. They've got mugs, they've got shirts, all kinds of cool stuff. I have uh, one of the shirts myself that has the uh, hashtag woodworker on it. And I also have a couple of the mugs that define what and who is a tool chick. So super excited with the merchandise that I have. I know that you will be satisfied as well. Um, And also great discount for those of you who listen to the podcast at checkout. If you enter the code maker mom, you will get a 20% discount off any of the merchandise that you buy. So that's just toolmomstore.com. All right, let's head back into the action. I'm going to ask a question that may or may not be something you <laughs> you want to answer, which is how kind has the U.S. voice been? You know, the, the U, my ability to establish myself within this practice, the way that I have, I, um, I think is strongly connected to me settling in Penland and having the support of this community and also the support of the people that support Penland, including collectors and, you know, different galleries, Mm -hmm. different entities. And so overwhelmingly I have felt nothing but support and generosity and, um, and eagerness to see what I can bring to the conversation of contemporary craft. That being said, I know, I know that for the most part, I have been seen as someone that comes from another place to contribute a new perspective. And so I, um, I don't have the sense of blending into the whole aside from or outside of my identity as a Puerto Rican, which is something that happens as soon as I step into the island, I become invisible in the best of ways. It's like I'm part of this collective and what I offer comes from that kind of multifaceted but somewhat unified um, cultural current. Mm -hmm. Um, And so that's not what I get here I don't consider myself you know the standard American I can't access certain parts of the culture because they're not coded into me so Mm -hmm. so it's different you feel I mean I feel like uh, do you feel like for 
the only word I can think of is tokenized. But what I'm trying to get at is, do you feel like you're asked to speak for the culture of Puerto Rico through your work when you're in the U.S.? Like, do you feel like that's become your job? And I'm doing that in quotation marks um, as an artist. And I think that it's such a great question because especially now in the context of, you know, the energies that are shaping the collective of the U.S. as it relates to race and um, discrimination and empowerment. I feel I have slipped into this um, space where what I'm doing is somehow elevated aside from what, aside from any inherent merit. It's just because it's appealing to that um rhetoric mm -hmm. it suddenly becomes relevant just by as you know by default and um and so i'm careful i'm careful i mean i'm surrounded by white peers yeah and they keep me in check not because they say things explicitly necessarily but because i know their plight i know their struggle i know how hard they work and so i want to make sure that i don't play too much into that I never did from the beginning it was just like I formed myself as an artist in Puerto Rico and that my, my conceptual language and my aesthetic views in many ways were inherited from having grown up in that space in the Caribbean and so when I came here I realized that I realized that there was some sort of novelty about that because other people in the in this mainland didn't have access to that so it felt like a perspective that um, could be valuable in, in the fact that it was an outlier perspective. But um, so yeah, so to answer your question, uh, yes, I feel that happens. Yes, I've noticed it and I'm careful. Yes, I'm sure throughout my um, trajectory, I have benefited from the fact that I am an outlier. Mm -hmm. um, at the end, you know, being aware is and keeping you know holding myself uh, as honestly as I can yep. to to my practice is all I can do um but I think about it because I have I have two daughters and my oldest daughter Paloma she's studying art she um she looks Latina uh, she's you know she has dark hair and she they both identify themselves with their with their a Puerto Rican uh, heritage, but one looks Latina, the other one's fair and kind of has like almost blondish hair and, um, and their experiences uh, are very different, you know, and, and, and they're both, you know, at least the oldest one is definitely grounding herself in art. Uh, the youngest one is still undecided, but um, yeah, I feel I'm embodying something that they're going to use to orient um, themselves as it relates to that culture and the American culture at large. So, yeah, I think I was, I was actually just thinking this morning about <clears throat> maybe some of the, I want to say like fascination with culture of otherness um mm -hmm. in the u.s is because like i was thinking of myself like i don't you know i was i was born here my family's been here for several generations and thinking like i don't like the u.s doesn't really have a culture like there's not um there's not like uh i'm thinking like dances that we grow up doing or songs that we grow up learning or that's connected deeply to roots because we're such a hodgepodge right we come from all over um and so i think sometimes that's what can draw us to really um appreciating art where the culture is not so far removed from the artist um yeah and so i think 
we have to be careful with that though, because uh, us as I would say like white Americans of not um, not trying to tokenize or mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. anything like that, but but showing general appreciation and understanding that I think some of it is just our fascination with with like what you talked about of being able to go back to your homeland and become invisible in the best of ways. Like, yeah, yeah. I don't, I don't think people here understand that. Um, yeah. <laughs> you know, I, yeah. I can identify that with being a queer American where it's like, I mm -hmm. appreciate walking into like a gay bar and becoming invisible, like you said, in the best of ways. Like I don't stick out. Um, and I feel amongst my people. And so, yeah. so I, yeah, totally yeah. Can, I can get that vibe. Um, but yeah, I think we have to do a better, maybe a better job. And also understanding that, like you mentioned, Puerto Rico is a commonwealth of the United States. Like Puerto Rico is part of our story. We just don't understand yeah. <laughs> how it's yeah. part of our story. Well, because, you know, it's, it's the U.S. is such a phenomenon. You know, it's such a vast territory. And I think there at some point there had to be an exchange uh, so that to pacify the sense of otherness and keep this country together and keep consensus, you had to relinquish certain things that set you apart. Yep. And I think that um, I think that happened, you know, organically throughout history as the country coalesced and as um, this entity of the whole um, became the most important thing as opposed to, you know, preserving whatever, um, you know, whatever, territorial. Whatever culture, even, yeah, that yeah we whatever from, yeah. native territorial um, idiosyncrasies uh, were inherited from the past. And so I think there, that was like an epic game, but I think there were some definite costs to that yeah. in terms of the nuance of what each region um, had acquired through many generations. Mm -hmm. And um, and I think, you know, there's a, a reorientation to trying to discover and rediscover all those yeah. things that were lost that I noticed in different parts, at least in the Appalachian region. Mm -hmm. And I think it's wonderful. A lot of them have to do with just actually looking at your context and, and the natural world around you and using that as a way to reclaim some of the knowledge that was lost, that is culture. Um, so, so yeah, it's really, it's really interesting. And, you know, in, in, in Puerto Rico, it's just such a small territory, mm -hmm. you know, the cultural voice is just so, can get so loud because there's no way to dilute it. Yep. That, um, yeah, that you, you feel you have it like on your back. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, and like you said, the, the U.S. is such a vast country um even me just uh, again something i've been thinking about recently like you look at the european countries and i'm like we're huge like the u.s yeah. is huge it's um, huge that's a lot of people to have like associated with with one country and i kind of laughed the other day as i was watching you know watching tv and i saw like a ancestry.com like um ad and i kind of it just dawned on me i'm like huh I bet nowhere else in the world is this even a thing <laughs> because for the most part, even in Europe, if you're traveling from like country to country, like you're still containing some of your culture that you right. take with you. Like if you grew up in Spain and you moved to France, like you're still taking that Spanish culture with you. Right, right. <laughs> you moved to France um, and easier probably to track some of that ancestry, but it's it's just phenomenal to me. I think that speaks to what you're talking about of people, I think in the U S are actually craving culture right now. We're yeah. trying to crave, like, what, what do we have? Like as a whole of the U S it feels very much right now, like the culture that we were taught growing up wasn't the full story. So we don't know it all. Number one, <laughs> or two, like, it's not really a positive thing to look back on most of the time. So mm. what, what things can we connect with from, like you said, that was lost, you know? Yeah, um, yeah. Because I do think at one point, regional pride played against yes. the ultimate yeah. goal of creating yeah. this epic, strong, 
power. Mm -hmm. And so I think now, now maybe there's, yeah, there's an evolution to that mentality and, and an openness to rediscover, you know, that richness that was maybe left Mm -hmm. along the side of the road as, as we were identifying ourselves uh, mostly with this patriotic sense of being American. Yeah. So it's like, um, and I think, you know, Alaska, Hawaii, and Puerto Rico, um, because uh, geographic be- from it a little bit. Yeah, because geographically we're just yep. in different places. You know that um, cultural integrity has has been preserved mm-hmm. in a different way. So, yeah, it's an interesting conversation for sure. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm in the middle of the country, so there's no cultural preservation <laughs> whatsoever. <laughs> I think there. I think there is. I, I think there's. It just isn't, I don't think it's uplifted or organized in a way that people can say, okay, this is what I'm about culturally. I think it's just kind of, but I noticed that wherever I go into the U.S., you're there for a week and then you start to understand like kind of like the microcosm that you're in culturally within the larger culture of the U.S. That is true. That is definitely true. I I see it more like when I travel outside of where I'm at, which, you know, would be my level set baseline of what I what I'm used to um you know I think of like when I got to travel to like New Orleans uh even just for a weekend and be like this is completely different (laughs) than you know what I'm used to and I loved it but it was like uh it was its own little like yeah micro planet going on down there (laughs) exactly and it's interesting because it's almost like you can't detect your own accent I yes. think it's a little bit like that with certain parts of the American culture, like only by contrast, can you yeah. see like, oh, oh yeah, I do have an accent. Yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. Um, well, Christy, I'm, I'm watching our time and, and uh, we made it through a number without getting interrupted. So I'm counting that as a huge win. Um, <laughs> and number two, I want to give you a chance to let people know um, how they can follow along with your work. Can you see yep, me? Yep, yep. Okay. Um, okay. Um, yeah, so you can find me at cristinacordova.com and also on Instagram at Cristina Cordova Studio. Those are the best ways. Uh, all my courses and all my events are listed in those two places. And um, yeah. Awesome. Um, and yeah, who knows? Maybe someday I'll, I'll be able to take a class from you at Penland. Um, that would be amazing. <laughs> you, would, you would love it. You would love it. I'm sure I would. Um, all right. Some of well, my favorite artists are um, figurative wood sculptors. So. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'll turn you on to a couple of those. <laughs> <laughs> I would love that. Um, so I'll include the links for both those places in the show notes so people can easily find them. And um, I really enjoyed chatting with you today. Yeah, likewise. Thank you so much for inviting me. And um, I had a great time. So thank, thank you. you. All right. So again, that was Christina Cordova. I will include the links on how you can find her and follow along with her work on um, social media in the show notes for today's episode. Best places to find that is first, if you're listening, check the description for the episode in your podcast app. If you're watching the episode on the Freeman Furnishings YouTube channel, check the description box down below. And lastly, you can head on over to Freeman Furnishings dot com forward slash podcast find the show notes for this episode as well as all the past episodes um be sure to follow along with the podcast over on instagram at crafting a revolution all one word no spaces no underscores at crafting a revolution And the link in the bio there is where you can find all sorts of things, including ways to support the podcast. You can find the link to head on over to Patreon to support on an ongoing monthly basis. There's several different tiers to choose from. That gets your name added to the start of every episode. And then there's also a way to do a one-time donation through that link. 
Um, and while you're over there on Instagram, make sure again, follow at Crafting Revolution and share about it uh, in your stories. You know, what episode did you really like? What one did you just finish listening to? All that good stuff. And while you're there, you can come on over and say hi and follow along with your hosts as well. So myself, Katie Freeman, you can find me at Freeman Furnishings. Again, all one word, no space, no underscore. Uh, and check out what I've got going on carving wise or resin wise or just shop dance wise. You can find my co-host Katie Thompson at Women of Woodworking as well as Pen and Chisel. Those are both of her um, ongoing passion projects, shining a light on growing the diversity of the woodworking field. <clears throat> so go check those out as well. All right, so this is the last episode for this week. We will be back with one brand new episode next week. And in the meantime, as always, let's go craft a revolution. One last thing that I really don't want to forget. I want to say a big thank you to Ashley Minnie, who not only wrote, composed, and sang the theme song for the podcast. So thank you so much, Ashley. She's amazing. Make sure you go follow her on Instagram as well at Ashley Minnie. She, her, fan, fan, go!